sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Um, uh, and we know that in all things God works for, those, uh, for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And then Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and thank you to Seth. We owe Seth Frankenfield a debt of gratitude because if he wouldn't have helped Juanita, Vince would have. <laughs> and he, we would have cleared the building. Vince does a lot of things well, but I'm not sure singing. That's a powerful song. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to show you a, a picture of Vince. Somebody else got in on it. Um, yesterday we were, Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday, we were, there were about 15 of us that were with uh, about 400 men at Spruce Lake. And the guy in the center there, if you can read that, read that name tag, is David Akers, who, uh, made his uh, mark in life by kicking a football. And uh, it was good to talk with David. Uh, uh, preachers know what it's like to miss the field goal on a Sunday morning and lay awake three or four nights feeling bad. I asked David, what's it feel like to miss a game-winning field goal? How many nights do you stay awake? <laughs> and he's another example of one who had a dream to play in the NFL, uh, was not drafted and had to go in through the back door and got cut a few times till the Eagles finally called and an example, an example of persistence. Uh, by the way, next year they have booked uh, Daryl Strawberry. Different sport. Uh, one who hit the baseball over the fence with ease. And in case you've heard some bad press on Strawberry, and it's out there, just came out recently again. Uh, I talked with Mark Swartley about it. I said, uh, you know, there's some uh, pretty wild stories about Strawberry as a result of, of an interview. And Mark said, yeah, we, we checked with his agent about that. And just to give you an example how media works, they interviewed Strawberry and he talked about his old life, which was filled with addictions of all kinds. They only played the first half of the interview, not the second half, which talks about his life 
being transformed by the power of the gospel and what Jesus has done in his life. So if you hear stuff about Strawberry and you see us promoting a men's retreat uh, next uh, December, um, just know that that will be a powerful time. And uh, we're all looking forward to that. 5020 Vision. Back in the fall of 1878, a father walked into his living room after work, and in his hand he had a partly concealed object. And with his boys looking on, he tossed it into the air. Rather than falling to the ground, it made its way across the room until it hit the wall and hovered against the ceiling and then fell to the floor. Um, it was a little toy made up of bamboo and cork and paper powered by a rubber band with a couple of screw-like uh, propellers that went in operate, uh, opposite directions, an early version of what scientists called a helicopter. The two boys, uh, the, the toy didn't last very long. Within a couple of hours, it was broken. But the memory of that thing defying gravity stayed with them forever. The boys' names you may recognize, Wilbur and Orville Wright. And with a dream, they felt they could fly, and more importantly, they felt they should fly. And so they set about tinkering with variations of that little toy. And on December the 17th of 1903, uh, Orville made his way into the history books by defying gravity for 12 seconds. The first powered manned flight from level ground at Kitty Hawk, the fulfillment of a dream. Last week, we talked about Caleb, the one who spent 45 years, actually 85 years, waiting for the fulfillment of his dream of freedom. Today I wanted to pick a little bit out of the life of Joseph, who didn't wait quite as long, about 13 years, tossed into the pit at about 17, uh, moves from the pit, from the prison to the palace in about 13 years, and then in the next couple of years reunited with his brothers. About 20 year delay between the, the dreams God gave him and the fulfillment of those dreams. Um, about uh, 20, 28 years ago, this book had a powerful impact on my life. Not a religious book. Uh, Stephen Covey passed away, I think, in 2012. As you see on the top of that, over 15 million copies of this sold. Let me just say that on Friday evening, I got a call from an old friend. We talked for 37 minutes and five seconds. That's the good thing about a cell phone. You can say, boy, that call got a little long. You can look and see exactly how long it was. 37 minutes and five seconds of a very animated conversation. 
Near the end of it, my friend says, I am over 70 years old. I should have been dead a number of times. The lifestyle choices I made and the situations I got myself into, I really shouldn't be here. And I wonder what, why God has kept me here. What is my purpose in life? Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, um, the habits, uh, number one, be proactive. Take a risk. Don't sit back. When God says, move, move. If it seems impossible, be proactive. We're going to play with this one a little bit. Number two, begin with the end in mind. Um, and I'm not thinking of eternity. I'm not thinking of heaven or hell. I'm thinking of the end of life. The question my friend asked at 70 plus years old, what is the meaning of my life? Uh, I'm approaching the end. Uh, if you're younger today, uh, think about beginning with the end in mind. And then the other uh, habits are, are just... When the book first came out, I think it was like 1990, um, Joel Hackman was here uh, helping us with Christian education, and he actually taught a Sunday school elective on this book. I don't know if any of you took it. But um, these principles are, are excellent. Begin with the end in mind. Uh, that chapter opens with Covey saying, take a half an hour and go sit in a quiet room and do this exercise. Imagine in your mind you're walking into a funeral. The music is soft. The flowers are pretty. You recognize the faces of your family and friends. You walk up to the casket and you sneak a peek in it, and to your alarm, you're laying there. You are attending your own funeral. You sit down in a chair, you pick up a program, and you read that there are four people that are going to speak at your service. The first one is an, a, a, a family member, a spouse, a child, someone very close to you in your family. The second one is a friend, an acquaintance, a good friend. The third one, uh, let's see, the third one is a co-worker someone you've worked with all your life. And the fourth one is a member of your church. In the exercise, Covey says, take out a piece of paper and write out what you would like each one of those speakers to say. How would you like them to remember you at your funeral? What kind of father, what kind of mother, what kind of husband, what kind of wife, what kind of child, what kind of co-worker, what kind of neighbor, what kind of friend was this person? Covey would say, whatever your answers are on that paper, is your definition of success. Whatever you want to be remembered for, in reality, is your definition of success. I remember reading a book uh, by Andy Stanley, uh, I don't know how many years ago. 
He said, I never take those exercises literally, but that one I did. I sat down and I wrote out my dream, my vision for my life on a piece of paper. And you know what I discovered? My definition of success had nothing to do with tangible accomplishments. The way the world would define success, it had everything to do with character. Who I was rather than what I did. So I would say, if your definition is about character, take a passage like the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. And take those phrases and see how you're doing. Love is patient. How am I in the patience category? Love is kind. How kind am I? Love keeps no record of wrongs. How many people am I still mad at? Or take Galatians 5, 22 and 23 and click off the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, meekness, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of those kinds. And, and if that is what you want to be about, if that is your dream, if that is your goal, what is your definition of success? That's a little more practical. That's a little, you can put some shoe leather to that. You may not be a Caleb. You may not be a Joseph. But every one of us should strive to be more like Jesus to work on character issues. Uh, Covey, I just quick slammed this in. Covey says, that's why he talks about habits. Um, a habit Habits are effective principles and patterns of behavior. And they're made up of knowledge, skill, and desire. And the intersection is the habits you build into your life that will produce your character for good or for bad. Knowledge, what to do, why to do it. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you have no fear in your heart for God, you're looking for the wrong kind of knowledge. The desire, the want to, the will. You got knowledge, you have to desire to be different, and then you develop skills. You work on habits. The Christian language is spiritual discipline. Discipleship, the kinds of disciplines that will make you who you really want to be. Covey says, live out of your imagination, not your history. So we're going forward. We're living out of a sanctified imagination and moving forward. The power of a dream. Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. NIV says, where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. Where is your vision? What is your dream? What is your definition of success? Last week I gave you Barna's definition of vision a clear mental image of a preferable future imparted by God to his chosen servants based on a clear understanding of God, self, and circumstances. Just a quick one from Maxwell. 
Maxwell says vision is awareness, it is attitude, and it is action. Awareness, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. The ability to see. Moses is described in Hebrews 11 as one who saw the invisible. He had the ability to see. Attitude, the faith to believe. Um, Aren't you glad that when Mary was approached by the angel, she didn't say, I don't do virgin births. She believed God for the impossible. When, uh, I mean, there are just so many examples of people with the faith to believe after God opened the eyes of their hearts and made them aware of a biblical definition of success that supersedes anything that the world will give you. Action is the courage to do. Um, Noah said to God, sorry, I don't do arcs, right? The courage for 120 years to preach the truth to the people, to withstand the mockery as he built an ark. Awareness, attitude, and action. In Genesis 37, Joseph, at 17 years old, had a dream. In verse 9, that was in 5, in verse 9, he has a second dream. Dream, a dream of God's blessing on his life, a vision that God would use him mightily. Those dreams seemed unrealistic, but Joseph never forgot them. I believe what carried Joseph through the ups and downs of life was the understanding that God had a calling and a purpose. Um, How can a dream become a nightmare? Uh, Mistreatment. Joseph, stripped of his robe that his father gave him, and I'm going to touch on this at the end. I should have touched on it at the beginning. But Joseph's family put the D in dysfunctional. His family tree, his roots, the mess he was born into... And that coat that he lost, getting thrown into the pit, uh, was a sign of favoritism from his father. It was also a hint who would be the heir to the family fortune. It's no wonder Reuben and the rest of the gang were angry. Joseph... In, and, and the guy's life is, is impeccable with maybe the exception of this part where a little bit of wisdom uh, might have, but who knows. Um, he ends up stripped of his robe, thrown into the cistern, and his brothers sat down to eat. They called out for a pizza, and there they sat, having pizza and root beer while Joseph was in the cistern. Sold for 20 shekels of silver, uprooted to Egypt. This is all in Genesis 37, 19 through 28. Somehow we need to learn 
that the disappointments and the mistreatments in life are insignificant in light of eternity. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, and Kathy read it for us, Romans 8.18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. 2 Corinthians 4.17, our light and momentary trials are achieving for us eternal glory that outweighs them all. Mistreatment will put you in the dungeon. The dungeon of darkness, dryness, delay, disappointment. Darkness, dryness, delay, disappointment can teach us that walking by faith and not by sight helps us grow in our dependence on God. Joseph was in the dungeon. The dungeon never got inside of him. Mistreatment. What about success? My guess is, as many dreams are destroyed by success as are destroyed by mistreatment. Genesis 39, 2-6 make it clear. God granted success to Joseph. That success caused his boss, Potiphar, to entrust Joseph with all that he owned. 39.6 tells us Joseph was well built, was a handsome man. Too often, well built, handsome men Climb the ladder of success, uh, Daryl Strawberry could hit a ball as good as anybody in baseball. And his success almost killed him. We all know people, good looks, all kinds of ability, a skill set that is unmatched, and they climb the ladder quickly and gracefully. The money is there, the homes are there, the vehicles are there, all of the flash that we would normally associate with success, the outside appearance. All the outward indicators of success and glamour. But too often, the spiritual life is neglected. And any relationship with Jesus that might have once been present is neglected and is often non-existent. Temptation. You heard about the mother baking cookies and she set them on the table and she said to her little boy, don't you dare eat those cookies. She walked out of the room and came back three minutes later and there he was perched on a chair leaning over the plate of cookies with one in his mouth. She said, I thought I told you not to eat the cookies. He said, I, I just came up to smell them and one got caught in my tooth. Temptation. Potiphar's wife, not once, not twice, day after day, coming at Joseph. The offer was repeated day after day. The temptation was accentuated by loneliness. Potiphar was a busy man. His wife must have spent many hours alone. Joseph was miles from home, miles from his family, quickly uprooted in a strange land with different customs. Everybody was doing it in Egypt. Who would know? For the second time, Joseph lost 
his coat. As he ran out the door with Potiphar's wife clinging to the coat. One more, choosing the wrong goals. How does a dream turn into a nightmare? When we use the wrong definition of success, I'm not going to take the time, but if you read Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 2, the first 11 verses, you will read the testimony of Solomon who denied himself nothing, built houses, acquired land, had slaves, had, uh, if it was out there, he tried it. Every conceivable type of pleasure, and he said, vanity. All is vanity. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11. I want to spend just a couple of minutes on the big picture. Romans 8:28, we know that all things God in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Genesis 50:20, you intended to harm me. You remember Joseph, Pharaoh missed the course in anger management. He would go off at the drop. One day he says to the baker, you're in jail. He says to his cupbearer, you're going to go in jail with him. And Potiphar, or uh, yeah, Potiphar's wife, that incident had caused Joseph to be thrown in jail, and here's Joseph in prison with Pharaoh's baker and his cupbearer. And they start having dreams. And one morning at the cafeteria, sitting down for breakfast, Joseph looks over and he says, why is your face so downcast? And they begin telling him. And Joseph prays to God for the answer for the dream, giving all the credit to God, tells uh, the baker and the cupbearer, both of you are going to be out of here in three days. The baker is going to the gallows. He will hang. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. The cupbearer will be restored to his position. And so Joseph says, as, as this is all taking place three days later, he says to the cupbearer, he pulls on his sleeve and says, when you get up there right next to Pharaoh, remind him of my plight. And the cupbearer forgot. And here's Joseph um, and that's, you know, do you know who these guys are? Marty McFly and Doc Brown, Back to the Future. Science fiction films about time travel. They're always going back to try to fix something that is presently happening. They feel that if they can go back to the past and, and recreate a situation, there will be a different outcome. Very humorous set of films. And they find to their chagrin that most of the stuff they fix comes out wrong anyway. If I was standing by the pit when Joseph is 17 years old and I'm saying, I'm going back in time and I'm going to prevent this 17-year-old kid from the pit, from slavery, being transported to Egypt, getting thrown in prison. I'm going to spare him all that pain. Guess what? 
20 years later, there's a famine in Egypt. There's no Joseph that had prepared Egypt in the seven years of plenty, and people starve. The whole nation, the Hebrew nation and the Canaanites, starved to death because somebody wanted to spare Joseph from difficulty. Plus, the messianic line that God had in place to bring Jesus through Joseph and Mary would have been altered. Now you say, well, if God, if Joseph wasn't there, God would have picked somebody else. Maybe he would have. I, I'm not going to argue that. But the point is, Joseph became a leader with the leadership skills necessary. Remember, knowledge, desire, and skill. How do you develop skill? How do you develop leadership qualities? How do you become the person that God needs in Egypt? You become that through difficulties. And the big picture, we have the advantage of being able to look back. When God gives us a vision or a dream, you, me, we have no idea how it will unfold. We have no idea when it will unfold. We've got no idea how long it will take. I hope you have some dreams that God hasn't quite completed yet, but you're hanging on and you're believing. From here to here, 20 years. For Joseph, it was 13 years until the dream began to make some sense. God needed a man in Pharaoh's court. God needed a man of wisdom in Egypt who would stockpile food during seven years of plenty the lives of countless people hung in the balance. When God prepares a man, he doesn't use our methods. When we want to prepare a man, we send him to Princeton. When God wants to prepare a man, he'll send him to prison. The guy that spoke on Friday to the men had spent some time in prison now working for Ravi Zacharias' ministry. Those 13 years must have seemed like eternity for Joseph. But he went from the prison to the palace in about one hour. He refused to wallow in self-pity. He refused to allow his circumstances to victimize him. He refused to let his dysfunctional family trap him in the same swampy mess that he witnessed while growing up. Let's just do this. Um, Just a couple of minutes. If the early years of Joseph's life teach us anything, they teach us that God is able to override any negative influence that we experience in childhood. The family of Joseph, you've got one father, four mothers, 12 boys, and one girl. In Genesis 30, 22 to 24, Jacob's favorite wife, he not only had a favorite son, he had a favorite wife. And you remember how he landed up in that position. She, her, her name was Rachel, and she was barren. 
And the quote that I love, when you think of knowledge, desire, desire, the cry of Rachel's heart was, give me children lest I die. Barrenness was a curse in those days. Still is, in many ways. Joseph, God intervened on her behalf and allowed her to get pregnant, and the baby that she delivered was Joseph. He was born because of divine intervention, and and in a very real sense, so were you. You're here today because God decided to put you here precisely here and now. Your birth was not an accident. Joseph's remarkable entry to the story is proof that one can rise above any negative or destructive circumstances, less than healthy situation in life. Do you have any idea how valuable each one of us is to God? You're not here today by coincidence. You're here by divine appointment. And we need every person here to give their heart into this transition and to fill out a survey with honesty and to, with desire and purpose, help this church go to another level. If you ever come to grips with how much God loves you, how valuable you are to God, your life will be transformed. Don't use the excuse, that's just how I was raised. Don't use the cop out, it's just the way I am. That's how my human nature functions. I can't help it. Don't blame your actions today or on what somebody did to you in the past. Joseph never allowed his anger to take over. He never allowed the backstabbing to make him bitter. He never allowed the disappointments and the delays of life to cause him to give up. The things that come into your life and mine that are intent on destroying us, God intends for good. To reshape our unrealistic dreams, to restore broken dreams, to realize our delayed dreams so that His purposes can be fulfilled. Let's pray together. God, I pray that each of us would have a dream. Each of us would have a vision and a purpose. Each one of us would understand why you put us here. Each one of us would look at our definition of success. Each one of us would think through what it means to leave a legacy for our family, for our friends, for our co-workers, for others in the kingdom. God, I pray that each of us would honor the dreams and the visions that you've placed in our hearts and that we would move forward with purpose, with focus, with clarity. Uh, Lord, that we would be aware that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that our attitudes would be one of faith, and that we would have courage to take action. 
that each of us individually would move in that direction and that corporately as a congregation we would work for the glory of your kingdom uh, to follow your leading and to achieve the purposes for which you placed us here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. spirit, saith the Lord. I pray that we would remember that, that our strength, our hope, our faith is in Christ alone. I pray that you would do exceedingly above all we could ask or imagine, according to your spirit at work in each of us. Go with us, empower us, protect us, give us a passion to love you and to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in peace.